Did you know that you can watch many of your favorite GLC programs all in one place for free? Just go online at www.glc.us.com and click on the GLC Teachers tab at the top of the homepage. From there you can scroll through dozens of quality GLC video archives containing over 100 full-length programs, updated weekly, and covering topics from Bible teachings and current events to scriptural, financial, and personal health. We've got it all covered at www.glc.us.com, so don't delay, start watching for free today. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. Let me welcome you to our program, Hebrew Heritage Bible Search. I'm Brad Young, and I'm very happy that today I also have my precious wife, Gail, who will be with us. We are going to be continuing our study of the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray in light of its Hebrew background and to look at the Hebrew scriptures as a foundation for studying and understanding the life and teachings of Jesus. I think one area that we have brought out quite a bit so far in our program is that we not only need to study the Bible, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and compare them with the New Testament, but we have to look at this area of study in between the Old and the New Testament. I know some scholars call this the intertestamental period. I actually saw in one study Bible, and I've seen it repeated in several others, where they call these the silent years, as if God did not say or do anything from Malachi to Matthew. I want to tell you that if you really study the history and the Hebrew heritage of our faith, that these years were anything but silent. As a matter of fact, they're probably the most important area of study in order to truly understand the New Testament, the early church, the life and teachings of Jesus, the message of the Apostle Paul, and the book of Revelation. We really need to look at the Hebrew heritage of our faith and to probe its background. We've really seen this to be the case when we've looked at prayer. Probably there's no other goal that any of us have that's higher or more important than to have a more meaningful prayer life and a deeper spiritual walk. I don't know, I think a lot of times when people start talking about their personal needs, they feel like what they really need is a new job or they need uh, you know, a better paying investment. I want to say today that really our problems aren't so much related to family or finances. The really the greatest need that we have is to have a deeper spiritual life, a more meaningful prayer experience. And prayer is so much more than asking petitions, making requests, asking God to help you. That's very important, and that's a part of prayer. And certainly God hears and answers prayer. But when we start looking at the way that Jesus taught us to pray, he uses a Jewish method of teaching. And we really have to consider the Hebrew background of his language. I want to share with you a quotation that a famous church leader made, uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer. Now, some aspects of Martin Luther's teachings I wouldn't agree with, and some areas I think are really good, but it's kind of interesting. Um, Luther, who translated the Bible into German, he talks about the importance of the Hebrew language. Uh, Luther wrote, the Hebrew language is the very best and richest in words and pure. It does not go begging. 
has its own coloring, defies replication. Without it, Scripture can never be understood correctly. The New Testament, although written in Greek, is full of Hebraisms and Hebrew expressions. So it is rightly said, the Hebrews drink from the font and the Greeks from the brooklets that flow from the font, but the Latins drink from the puddles. I don't know about you, but I don't want to drink from the puddles. And you can kind of see this progression, how that Luther in his translation work, I think other experiences, realize the value, the importance of studying Hebrew. And this is really a foundation that we've used in a lot of our studies so far, is that although the New Testament was originally written in Greek, the writers were Jews, they were writing to Jewish people, they were thinking in Hebrew, a lot of their theology is connected to the Hebrew Bible. And we even have strong linguistic evidence to argue that significant portions of the New Testament were originally written in a Semitic language. I would argue definitely Hebrew, like the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the first 15 chapters of Acts, the book of Revelation, probably all originally written in Hebrew. Well, today, to kind of set the tone and lay the foundation for our study of the petition in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're going to read from the Psalms, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is this great praise of the law, the Torah, the commandments, the ordinances, God's righteous sentences, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Sadly, today in the church, we have a strong Marcionism. I use the word Marcionism uh, to refer to a scholar, learned religious leader, about 130 A.D., who argued that the Old Testament was no longer valid for the New Testament church. Now, tell me the truth. Have you ever heard that taught in the church? I remember one uh, author who's very well known who argued that the Lord's Prayer was actually an Old Testament prayer. And the only prayers of the New Testament you should study are those that come after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, I've heard some people say, well, we don't need to study Old Testament prayer. Well, I think what we have been seeing is that we really have to lay a foundation in the Hebrew scriptures and look at the period in between the Bibles to really understand what Jesus is teaching. Our key passage today as a foundation for the petition Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as in Psalm 119. And we'll read verse 33 through verse 40. As you know, Psalm 119 is what we call an acrostic psalm. Every section, every stanza is, starts with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the longest chapter of the Bible, and it's probably one of the most important ones for us to meditate upon. Um, I don't know, I have so many verses from Psalm 119 that just jump out at me. They mean so much to me. I love that one that just says, uh, Open my eyes and reveal to me the deeper mysteries of your word. Gal Enai, the Hebrew text says, this revelation. But here in verse 33, the psalmist writes, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways Establish your word to your servant. 
as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. May the Lord grant us understanding as we study these words from the book of Psalms. Notice the love that the author has for the ordinances, the commandments, the Torah, the law of God. I don't know today when I talk in Christian churches, different meetings, different areas about the will of God. Most of the time, Christians say, I want to figure out, discern some way the will of God so I'll know what to do. Maybe I'm supposed to go to this university and study. Or maybe it's the will of God that I go here as a missionary. Or maybe it's the will of God that I should marry this person. Or it's the will of God that I should buy this car. Or what's God's will on this matter? This is kind of interesting when we really study the will of God in the scriptures. Because over and over again, we hear phrases like, I delight to do thy will, O Lord. The Bible, the Torah, the law of God reveals what is the will of God. We don't sit around trying to discern, well, what's this or that? Is this your will? Is that not your will? Am I in the permissive will or not in the will of God? You live your life as a disciple obeying Torah, keeping the law of God and all the other things begin to fit together and take place in our lives. The problem we have today is there's a rebellion against the commandments. There's a rebellion in the church against the Torah, the revealed will of God. We have a situation where we have many that kind of approach the Bible kind of like Marcion. We should... You know, do away with the Old Testament. We certainly don't want to talk about commandments. After all, we're called to fulfill the Great Commission and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, I wonder how many of these people that say we should do away with the commandments and fulfill the Great Commission, that that's the most important thing we should be doing. I wonder how many of them ever even read what Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Because when I read... My Bible and the Gospel of Matthew, the risen Lord told the disciples, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. Um, All of you raised, study the Bible, can quote the rest of that in Matthew 28. But I just want to stress that first part because I think it's so neglected today in our Hebrew Heritage Bible search. Jesus actually instructed the disciples, his followers, to go into all the world and to teach commandments that his followers, believers, are supposed to obey. And he said, make disciples. What are disciples? They're learners. They're students. They're people that really want to learn what the Word of God teaches Now think about what the word Torah itself means. A lot of times Torah is translated as law in our English translations. And this is probably the greatest travesty is the worst translation of all times because Torah has very little to do with law. Torah comes from the Hebrew word yara, which means to teach, to reveal. Torah is really a revelation of who God is. It's showing the divine character. When we understand the divine character, it really leads us into a more active, a more meaningful prayer life. If we want to obey the commandments of God, if we want to fulfill Torah, we pray the prayer, Thy will be done in heaven as it is in earth. There's an old Jewish prayer from the Tosefta. I like The way that Rabbi Eliezer said this, I think it kind of brings out some of the meaning of Jesus' prayer. Rabbi Eliezer said, Do your will in heaven 
and give contentment of spirit to those who fear you upon the earth. And what is good and favorable in your eyes do. Blessed art thou who hears and answers prayer. Well, here we have in this Jewish prayer from the Talmudic literature, a prayer that also talks about doing the will of God, fearing God, enjoying the presence of God. If we would fear God, keep the commandments, the duty of every individual, we would understand how the course of our lives should develop and we would have greater uh, revelation knowledge. Before I turn uh, our attention over to Gail and some of the questions that, uh, that have come to our ministry and other questions that arise from our study in Hebrew Bible search, I wanted to just share with you one quotation from a famous Jewish scholar, Abelson, who wrote the book, the eminence of God. He's talking here about prayer and entering into the presence of God. And I like the way that he connects this with love because if you really obey the Torah, you will learn how to love others and live according to the commandment that Jesus gave us, the commandment of love. Uh, Abelson writes that uh, what is really the purpose of prayer is that you would enter into the highest joy from the presence of God. Now, let me just stop here to say there's such a difference between what we talk about as the happiness that the world offers and the joy of the Lord, the joy that comes from experiencing daily the presence of God. And that's why we need to uh, develop a better, more meaningful prayer life. The holiest joy that comes from the presence of God. There is no religion, Abelson writes, in which the lo word love and the idea it stands for does not occupy a commanding place. It is mysticism that pushes love to the forefront. The mystic's idea is communion with God. His soul reaches out in living yearning to embrace God. And he knows that he has found God because he has felt the thrill of his answering love. Now, Abelson wrote this, I think, about 1915. And yet, very much of what he saw uh, remains true for us today. Sometimes when we talk about mysticism, Jewish mysticism or Christian mysticism, there's a lot of different approaches to it. But the idea is really that you would have union with God in the mystical experience. I think what's so different about Jewish mysticism, and when we apply it especially to prayer, is that it is really something that you do. You do the will of God and you start putting the will of God into operation by living and fulfilling Torah. Thank you very much for that. Um, the question that comes to mind uh, as I think of, think of things as you're talking is um, how do we, um, in observing the commandments, how do we look at building the fence around the Torah uh, what does that mean? And what about the light commandments and the heavy commandments? And how does that fulfill the will of God? How does that work? Now, this phrase of building a fence around the Torah is one that has been abused a lot of times in Christian teachings. Some say that the rabbis, the Jewish people are such legalists they're trying to build a fence, make it you know, almost impossible to observe. But really, building a fence around the Torah was a way that you could interpret the Bible to apply it so that you can keep it in your yard and you can do what God has asked you to do. How do you live a life that's pleasing to God? What is the right decision? You make a choice to obey God. Actually, as you've talked about these light commandments, weighty commandments, Jesus our Lord could have used this in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that if you teach people to disobey, 
you'll be called least in the kingdom of God. But the one that teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom. And I think we need to encourage one another to study the Bible so we know really what it teaches and what it really asks of us to do. And that we would fulfill the commandments in love with the fruit of the Spirit. All right. Then the next question then would be, um, what's the highest form of worship? How, would, how do you uh, work and how do you worship and how do you apply all of this so that you can fulfill the will of God? A lot of people look at the highest form of worship as some kind of praise war or how do you praise God longer or the songs. But it's kind of interesting from the Jewish perspective because the emphasis is on study as a form of worship. You know, this isn't so far from our New Testament. Study to show yourself approved unto God. And actually, the Greek text there probably means more than study, like you're really earnest, you're really dedicated, you're really committed. And so, study becomes a form of worship. Study can be a prayer to God, because you're studying the Bible, you're using your mind, you're using your heart, you're using every aspect of your life by study. Study is the highest form of worship. When you study, um, what are the best uh, tools available, uh, say, on a public library shelf? Or if you go to a bookstore and you, and you think you want to buy a book that's going to help you study this deeper or, or more, which one should you get? And how do you go about finding that book? How do you know which book to go get? Because there's a whole lot of books to go look at a lot of titles to go through. How do you get a book that will help you understand this better? Now, now I know you're getting these questions from our ministry. These are things that people are asking all the time. Mm -hmm. How do we study? How do we learn more? Uh, one way I think that's good to pick out a book is sometimes to look at the bibliography. Is this person just writing a novel and there's no bibliography, no notes, they're just making it up? Or do they document what they're saying? Do they show that they've really studied it? And I guess I, sh you know, got to say that, you know, some of the books that I've written I think would be helpful in this area as well. Uh, we've got the book Jesus the Jewish Theologian. Uh, my book, The Jewish Background of the Lord's Prayer. I always say, if you're going to read the Jewish background of the Lord's Prayer, that book, you really have to look at the footnotes because I have a lot of material in the notes that will help you. Yeah. So sometimes knowing the book from a Jewish author uh, can help you. I find that some of the writings of uh, Heschel, H-E-S-C-H-E-L, would be helpful. Joseph Telushkin, uh, who's written a book like The Wisdom of Judaism, is a book that is uh, very helpful. Our Father Abraham, a very fine Christian author, Marvin Wilson, yes. who uh, has good documentation and bibliography. So then did Jesus, um, did, did he use Hebrew or did he use Aramaic or uh, how much Greek did he use? I mean, uh, there seems to be some controversy in those arenas, and mostly it's over whether he spoke Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. So what did he do? This is really something of a tragedy. I think today, if you would ask the majority of biblical scholars, probably the consensus would say, well, he spoke Aramaic. And there are those that say that he spoke Greek. He may well have known all three languages to some degree. Uh, and the Jewish diaspora, largely based in Iraq, Iran of Jesus' time, a large community of Jews, there the Jewish people spoke Aramaic. Uh, what we have seen from our study of linguistics, and especially the Talmudic literature, is that Hebrew seems to be the earlier language. 98% of all the Dead Sea Scrolls are written in Hebrew. Even the manual of the Dead Sea sect that's for their daily life. So 
I think if you're going to say if you're going to write a holy book, say like the life and teachings of Jesus, the language to write that would be Hebrew. And we have evidence that the people knew Hebrew, they understood Hebrew. Almost all the prayers are written in Hebrew. The parables in the rabbinic literature are all written in Hebrew. And I feel like there is something of a spiritual quality in the Hebrew language that helps you understand how to approach God in prayer. Now, I actually started in my own scholarly development to study Greek first. And, of course, I deal with both Greek and Hebrew and I'm working with the Bible Translation Project, the Hebrew Heritage Translation of the Bible. But I've found that, you know, Hebrew is so important even in New Testament studies. So is Jesus the first person to teach in parables? Absolutely not. Uh, as I've mentioned, we find a lot of parables in the rabbinic literature, parables that are very similar to Jesus' teachings. The parable of the two builders, for instance, the wise and the foolish builders, we have an almost exact parallel that's attributed to a rabbi, Elisha ben Avuya, also known by the name Acher, but he talks about two builders. That's kind of interesting because he makes a similar application that Jesus made in the parables, which goes right along with the petition we're studying uh, but let thy will be done. Let me do your will, O Lord. Uh, because it says the one who has studied much Torah but has no good works. In other words, he's kind of heavy on the academic side. He studies, but he doesn't put it into practice. He says that's the foolish man that builds his house on a small bricks instead of a large stone foundation so that even if a little water collects at its base, it will make the house fall down. Very similar to Jesus when he's concluding the Sermon on the Mount. The one who hears these words of mine and does them. What is he like? He is like the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And even if there is a great amount of water that comes and falls at the base of that rock, it will not in any way fall down. Uh, if we're going to come back to Jewish prayer from the time of Jesus, let me just conclude our program today by referring to the benediction of repentance. Make us return, O our Father, unto your Torah. Draw us near, O our King back into your service and bring us again in perfect repentance into your presence. Blessed are you, O Lord, who delights in repentance. Thank you so very much for being a part of our Hebrew Heritage Bible Search. If you enjoyed this clip, please feel free to check out the full version in the link located in the description panel below. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. As always, help yourself to the diverse array of teachings located on this YouTube channel or on our website at glc.us.com.